you'll remember that back in June, in the peak of the Three Arrows Capsule lunar debacle, I stick, stuck my hand up and said, listen, I think it's time to buy ETH. Um, ETH got absolutely decimated at that period of time. And so we started adding to our ETH positions. I never sold anything in the bear market because my time horizon is really out to the end of this decade. So I'm looking for massive weakness to add to my positions to make as much money over time as I can because I truly believe in cryptocurrency, digital assets, and Web3 at large. I think this is game-changing for the future of the internet. And that view of mine has been proven out as well by looking at the traditional finance people coming into the space, the famous hedge fund managers coming into this space, but also what everybody in the crypto world has built is the rails for the parallel or future financial system, and we're just migrating across to it over time. But what they've built is so profound that even the central banks themselves are going to build their central bank digital currencies on blockchain rails. Central banks and other supranational organizations are issuing bonds on crypto rails. So it really is game on. Even though we've gone through this regulatory cycle and it feels miserable, the broader adoption is happening so much so that the old world has already admitted that the world we live in is a lot better. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, we will step into Raul Powell's insightful journey as he guides us through his profound reflections on the evolving macro environment, the dynamic technological revolution, the crucial investment time horizon, and the vast landscape of extraordinary opportunities that lie ahead. So without further ado, let's get started with the video. But I found in my work that two things really outperformed technology and crypto because they've got secular adoption cycles too. Okay, so where are we in the li liquidity cycle? You see a lot of noise on Twitter because everyone's starting to pick up about this liquidity. Again, I'm using liquidity here as a proxy for debasement, not just pure liquidity. I think that's less relevant. So the GMI weekly liquidity index year on year bottomed exactly on ETH bottomed in June. That was the first signal to me that something has changed. So that got me focused on buying ETH. Then we saw the non-confirmation of ETH when Bitcoin bottomed in November. That was really interesting to me. And that coincided with ongoing increase in liquidity. If you remember, it started with the Bank of Japan. They started printing money to buy JGBs in a process called yield curve control expanding their balance sheet significantly. That was then followed by the Bank of England, who were expanded their balance sheet to try and bail out some of the pension system and also kind of stop their bond market getting out of control. The Chinese have been slowly debasing their own currency by a slow crawl of debasement. And then we saw the US come in in March when they had to quickly inject money into the banks, which they've been drawing out again. Anyway, the trend is higher, but too many people get fixated on the next chart, which is the overall trend itself, not the rate of change, which is more important. But the overall trend, well, that is the same trend as most asset prices. And that's because debasement is lowering the denominator. So what we saw is that massive rise in liquidity that happened or debasement that happened in 2020 and 2021. And that some of that got withdrawn. But we're back basically to the long-term trend where we've been crawling for a while now. So we're not seeing a massive shrinkage in the balance sheets. We're seeing some expansion, which is what that, that previous chart showed you. So that's what's driving the market higher, much to everybody's chagrin. Now, if you remember, Bitcoin was launched in 2008, 2009 period. That is the same period when interest rates went to zero. And guess what? The halving cycle is exactly the same as the economic debt payment cycle. They're all the same thing because they were all born at the same time. So that, I think, is the big driver. The macro is the big driver. So when we zoom out, we look at the Bitcoin charts on a log scale. And you can see the trend rate of adoption over time. The acceleration is when the balance sheets start getting used and people start putting money into the space and the space grows over time. And we will see that 
ongoing. So the total crypto market cap hit three trillion at peak. What will it be at next peak? Probably ten trillion. As more money comes in, more people stay in the system um, and opt out of the old system, or find new uses and applications in a Web three world that makes the internet just better, fairer, and more democratized and more decentralized. But that trend rate of Bitcoin, well, we got in that beautiful cyclical low the buying opportunity we were all looking for. People are still arguing whether it's going to go lower, etc. The probability is it put in the lows and now we're on the up cycle. And it's what I think is the start of crypto spring. I think we, we, we've been through crypto spring and we're going to be moving into crypto summer. Now let's take a look at some recent developments in the cryptocurrency market. BlackRock Bitcoin ETF could unlock $30 trillion worth of wealth, Bloomberg analyst says. Tim Draper still thinks Bitcoin is heading to $250,000. Coinbase shares surge as agreements for spot Bitcoin ETFs are confirmed. Speculative fever builds. Predictions of 100-point up move in S&P 500 and Bitcoin over $100,000. Rayscale complains to SEC court for not approving Bitcoin spot ETF. Rich Dad author gives Bitcoin new mega prediction. Bitcoin to $120,000 next year. Buy Bitcoin six months before the halving and sell 24 months after, says Plan B. And we'll talk about that in a sec. Crypto summer is the point when prices start going parabolic. It usually coincides with the money printer go burr or more cowbell, as I like to say. So there's some really good analysts in the crypto space. And one of them I really like is Tech Dev. I subscribe to his newsletter. I have no affiliation. Um, but I subscribe to his work because I think he's very thoughtful and is not subject to hyperbole, but just very thoughtful in what he does. We do know that a lot of people like fractals in crypto. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Do they give you an informational advantage? I think generally, contextually, they help you understand human behavior and how prices can move. I don't really like to trade on them all the time or you know, as the main thing, but as supporting evidence, often interesting. I've also had some spectacular failures with them too. If you remember the ETH call, the uh, you know, the next leg higher call back in 2021, that was based on a fractal. It completely failed, but luckily I owned call options, so it wasn't that painful. But anyway, so y you never always know. But the point being is this cycle is pretty similar to 2010-11 cycle. Same kind of setup. So that's interesting to me. What's interesting, it's a similar kind of setup um, from the 2017 cycle, 15-16 uh, cycle. So we've got a similar structure and a similar kind of market. 2019 was a bit weird because we had that big correction uh, over all of 2019 after a huge run to begin with, 300% up, then a big correction down, and then we sort of went parabolic. I have a feeling we might go parabolic earlier here because I think we're getting closer to a banking crisis within the regional banks that will require the Federal Reserve to step in. Interest rates are kind of getting out of control, so interest rates going up, the yield curve inverted, bad news bears for the banks. Uh, you can use the KRE ETF to see where we are in that, but if that starts breaking 35, 30, then it's game on for more cowbell to come because the Fed are going to have to bail these people out, and then we've got the commercial real estate problems behind it. So that's the kind of backdrop of why the cowbell will come and I think it's even an excuse. Maybe that's the reason the Fed are tightening rates even further is to create a crisis so they can cut rates so they can monetize the debt. Because if they don't, they have to print more money because the interest rates are higher to pay for the debt payments. And that becomes a total catastrophe. So what's your price prediction for Bitcoin at the end of 2023? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.